Good evening, everybody, um, and thank you for joining us um, on World Mental Health Day. Um, my name is Nick Reed, um, and I work for Saracen Horse Feeds. Um, and this evening, I'm joined by Andreas Lee Fug um, from Operation Centaur. And we're here to talk about um, real horsepower and how it can be used um, in promoting good mental health um, and in therapy situations. Um, this is actually the start of a series um, that where we'll be focusing on mental health. We'll be looking at different themes um, each month um, and look at how horses can be beneficial um, in helping people with particular um, mental health conditions. Um, so we do have um, a section here for questions on the right hand side um, of the page. Um, you'll see a, a questions tab. Please feel free to ask any questions um, as Andreas gives his presentation um, and we will refer to them at the end um, to answer all the questions that we can. Um, but for now, I'll hand over to Andreas. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you very much um, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, good evening. Um, so, World Mental Health Day, when when um, Nick and I first started talking about this and also looking at how we could sort of collaborate and particularly also highlighting how um, therapy horses are, of course, in the first place, horses, and, and they all have their, their specific needs as well. And actually feeding plays a, a big role in that. So maybe we can, we can get to that um, right at the end. And I think it's also going to be the topic of um, some of the videos we have we have made. But for this evening, what I'd really like to, to do is unpack a little bit of, of, of my experience over the last 20 or so years of bringing horses into psychotherapy and, and sort of demystifying some of the ideas around, you know, what do horses actually do in, in there? It's not magic, um, but it is actually quite extraordinary how, how horses actually can play a role in, in mental health. And I suppose the, the, I think the first video that we actually made was looking at some definitions and, and defining the difference, for example, between what is therapeutic and what is therapy. And because we all kind of say, oh, you know, I went for a ride this morning or so therapeutic or I brushed my horse and was so therapeutic. And these things are all therapeutic, like lots of other things, like having a massage or going for a walk, but they're not therapy because in order to, for something to be therapy, something needs to be processed that needs processing. And you have to have a person who knows what they're doing ar around that. So for me, those are two really quite important um, issues, which hopefully we can kind of pick up again uh, a little bit later. I'm a psychologist and uh, a psychotherapist, and I've been a lifelong horseman. I think the first first time I sat on the horse was when I was about three years old. Um, I think my first word was was horse, or at least the Flemish equivalent, because I'm from Belgium originally. Um, much to my to my um, parents' disappointment, I'm, I'm sure they probably would have preferred to hear mum or dad uh, <laughs> than horse. But there there we are. Um, and um, I was going to mention that about um, about two years ago, we kind of published this this book, which is an evidence based framework on how horses actually help in psychotherapy and in uh, coaching. Because I've been an academic for most of my adult life, the idea of evidence was really quite important to me because it's kind of making a claim to something is anecdotally is really important, but actually to to be able to provide evidence that something actually does work is 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 actually much much stronger. Um, can I have my presentation back for a moment? I'm not sure. There we go. Because um, I was just about to to move on from 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 that and um you know evidence comes into a number of different guises and there is um qualitative and quantitative the qualitative stuff really gives the richness and the quantitative gives the numbers to actually show um how how things have operated or indeed how things have changed and ultimately again therapy is is about change something that's therapeutic can momentarily change something it may shift something it may shift the bad mood but it's not really going to address some of the underlying and some more difficult challenges that some people might um might face so let's start taking a really big step back and kind of looking at how how we've lived with horses for a very very um long time and 
some of the Operation Centaur horses are shy horses, um, so they're they're working horses. So we've done quite a lot of digging around, kind of looking at how, um, you know, um, from Henry VIII's sort of edict to only really uh, breed big uh, horses to get a big war horse into how these horses helped us in the Industrial Revolution, how they helped us in agriculture, how they're now very much still around in leisure and in sport and in and in and in racing um but in some ways their role has shifted throughout our relationships um with them and the way i sort of see this is that therapy as is yet another almost a sort of a reinvention of of horses to kind of keep relevant um in in how they actually play a role in our our lives and Operation Centaur is an organization we set up to really kind of bring working horses in whatever guise is uh, relevant. And obviously we, we're in London, so we try to make horses relevant into urban uh, communities as well. The guys who go out with with the with the Shire horses in Hyde Park, for example, um, you know, if you take a, a Massey Ferguson out in Hyde Park, nobody bats an eyelid. But if you bring a pair of Shire horses around, everybody stops and wants to talk actually quite a lot of people who are on their own as well so that's already quite a nice connection of how horses actually brings uh people together and and gets us to, to kind of reconnect and talk i'm going to say a lot about connecting and, and reconnecting because ultimately i think that's really one of the big keys into how we can look at uh changing why horses people are going to say you know why not cows why not dogs and all of that i mean in my opinion, you could probably do this with cows as well. Um, but there's something about horses that invites something quite different. They are um, gregarious. They like social contact. Um, and they're very clear sort of hierarchical positions. Any of you who, who kind of get a new horse and introduce a new horse into a herd will notice that it's not at all obvious where that horse is going to fit. You know, they may they start out probably on the bottom of the herd and get pushed to the edges, but then somehow they might sort of pal up. And according to how they build those kind of relationships in the herd, they will actually get a, a certain um, um, place a more sort of stable place in 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 that herd and that's really useful because if you then throw some people into the mix you actually see which of these horses in this herd are actually looking to kind of create a relationship with people which of these horses don't want to have anything to do with the people that come in so a lot of things um become um quite obvious to us just by standing back and observation and ultimately observation is the beginning of any kind of scientific process you just kind of look and you become curious and you start asking questions another reason why horses i think work very well in in the therapeutic space is because they're actually highly anxious creatures as well as flight animals they're always ready to kind of just run off freeze or fight probably not quite as likely but but those kind of responses are kind of always there under the surface for horses and you would argue that actually for people that's pretty similar we're quite anxious beings as well and unlike horses we don't regulate ourselves quite as well so a horse could for example get really scared of an umbrella but three seconds later probably forgets about it and goes on so conversely when we wake up in a bad mood first thing in the morning sometimes it kind of takes us half the day to actually get out of, of of that mood or indeed we kind of doggedly hold on to feeling miserable for the rest of the of the day and emotional regulation again very important um element of um of 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 therapy um as well therapy is all about language and i'll say a bit about that in a few in a few moments and horses um, are incredibly skilled communicators, but they don't actually need um, language for that. They may, of course, have a particular language amongst themselves, but it's not in the same way as we understand language. It doesn't really matter whether they speak English or, or German. They, they don't really care about that. They're very, very skilled um, communicators. So what we can already learn from that is that, of course, as group beings, to understand how we fit into a group, like how we fit into our family, how we fit into our workplace is already quite important. Um, how do we actually manage our anxiety? I think most of us do experience anxiety to, to a certain extent. I mean, 
anyone who wakes up at three o'clock in the morning usually doesn't have a lot of pleasant thoughts. It tends to be kind of quite preoccupying sort of thoughts, quite a lot of anxiety around that. Um, and also, how do we stay focused without being so distracted by the past or, or the future? Um, how do we go beyond our head and also trust our gut? And I think this really is, is kind of following on from this point of communication um, in a way, because language and thought is all much head stuff. And actually, gut is more about energy and, and you know, the way horses communicate with one another. We have that too. So anyone who's ever walked in to a meeting and sort of felt that there was a bit of an atmosphere um, going on. That's what I mean by, by that. We know that something had happened or there's been some discord or we come home and we say hello and we don't get quite a response that we, we, we kind of think as usual. How do we know that? It's not through language, it's not through our head, but it's really very much through our gut. And working with horses brings that a lot more central. So in many ways, technically, what we're talking about really is we decentralize speech and language and we use other means to try and make sense of um, ourselves. And as Alain de Botton points out, the genius of equine assisted psychotherapy is that the horse at the center of the therapy invites the talk, but it does not actually require it to communicate. And why is that genius? Because we can have experiences that don't require language. And yet, once we've had them, we then can't wait to actually start talking about things. And this is particularly useful in um, therapy because most people who come into therapy don't really want to talk um, about things. Therapy is called, um, from the days of Freud, the talking cure, because language is one of the main currencies of therapy. And of course, language is, is one of the ways that we can label how, you know, we have this sensation this feeling inside of us and we don't quite know what to call it but if i want to kind of communicate that feeling to you or to a therapist or to anyone i have to find a word and a label to hang on to that because it's the only way it actually gets to the outside but what do you do if actually i can't do that or i can't talk something important here i think about where language comes from we're all kind of wired to um, acquire language. We're all born with the ability to acquire language, um, but we're not preloaded with language. If, you, you know, if you're born in China and people start speaking Chinese, you'll speak Chinese. Um, it's, it's, it's not something that's preloaded. And what that means is that language actually belongs to the context. Language belongs to culture, whereas the ability to speak belongs to nature. And this thing I was talking about, gut versus head, gut is really nature and um, language is head and culture and anything that's sort of acquired. So we get lost a little bit in that culture, in that language, um, because it's only one way that we have to try and make sense of ourselves. And what are we making sense of? Um, I, I would argue that from my sort of um, many years of experience in, 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 in managing other people's mental health is that there's three really important elements to that. It's how do people make decisions? How do they manage their relationships? And how do they make sense of themselves? Um, decisions is not just about being decisive or indecisive, but decisions is very much about loss, actually. Um, you know, if I choose one thing, I have to unchoose a whole number of other possibilities. And that's one of the main reasons why people avoid making decisions um, about things. Um, relationships, very much about perspective taking. Um, what is that horse thinking? Can I put myself in the position of, of, of trying to figure out what is going on for a horse without necessarily anthropomorphizing this horse? So for example, if I say this horse hates me, you know, I actually don't know whether a horse has the ability to to hate. So rather than kind of thinking I am hated, you're thinking, why would I make that kind of interpretation? How would I make that uh, that leap in, in, in that sort of perspective, taking that relationship? And of course, then how do I make sense of myself? There's a lot of literature since the 1950s that tell us that we are the experts on ourselves. We know best. Um, we know where it hurts and all of that. There's another view on that that actually says, 
we are strangers to ourselves. We make the same mistakes over and over and over. We get ourselves in the same positions over and over and over. And we actually can't get out of those cycles and out of those repetitions. And it really takes someone else to be able to help us spot that and to be able to kind of take us out um, of that. In all these three elements, I think we work with horses very successfully. And I believe fundamentally that what horses do in therapy is what they've always done for us since we had those very, very early uh, relationships with them. They speed things up. They make things go faster. Um, when I was seeing people in my clinic in, in town, um, things would typically last maybe between three and six months, sometimes multiple years, depending on, on what people would bring to present with horses. My experience is that things have always gone um, a lot faster um, than um, you think. And part of that is because we don't just rely on language. Um, people sometimes come to therapy and they want to tell a story, but actually this is not a new story. This is a story they've been telling themselves and telling other people for a very, very long time. They're actually quite sick and tired of telling the same thing over and over again. So maybe the narrative is actually not that important. Maybe there is something that we don't need to talk about, that we don't need to kind of be able to say or to pinpoint, but horses can bring something quite different to that and speed things up quite a bit. So from my sort of clinical experience, I developed uh, a model which has five steps, which is safety, connection, reconnection, movement, and direction. And I'm going to talk through these steps um, one by one. It's a staged model. What that means is that obviously it kind of you move through these, but it doesn't mean that you, there's a kind of a, a clear uh, path through them. So you can kind of go really and go and work in whichever of these of these elements except for the safety one because of course that um tends to come uh first because safety always comes first um safety not in the sort of sense of you know when we all get on the plane or we go to a, a conference and, and and people start saying well there's here the, the sort of the fire exits and um and all of that um and we all switch off and glaze over this is very very different because i always start telling people that they're going to go into the space and there's going to be horses walking loose um, or running loose. Um, none of the work I do, by the way, is, 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 is written work with very few exceptions. Um, so people are, are wandering around in fields or in paddocks or in a manege with, with horses around them. And of course, I can't keep people safe. You know, I'm, I don't have those incredible powers that I can control people or horses and ensure that um, they're not going to get hurt. So putting that to people is already a really, really big um, starting point because people want to hear that they're going to be looked after. People want to hear that someone else is going to look after them and provide a frame to look after them. And of course, I can do some of that. I mean, I can I can ensure that the horses I select to do the work with a particular person or particular group are very well selected. We know them well. Um, they're not the horses that um, I would think would potentially be aggressive but all horses can kick and all horses can bite and that's just a reality that people have to accept and that process of starting to accept that actually I am responsible for keeping myself safe is a really really important one because it grounds people probably and some people probably for the very very first time um, and they hadn't been grounded like that in a long time they become accountable they become accountable to look after themselves and I also give them very very clearly the permission to to not enter the space as well because horses don't really care whether you're on one side of the fence or the other side of the fence you're still there you're still present your energy still has an impact on whatever happens so there's no real issue um, around that but for therapeutic purposes it gives you a lot of agency it gives the person a lot of agency a lot of accountability and a lot of thinking I can actually do something I can look after my own safety here right now if I have to and people can leave they can climb the gate they can come and stand behind me they can climb in a tree they can do all kinds of things and they have done all kinds of things when they don't particularly feel feel safe but this contract almost to start a therapy process is really incredibly important it makes it very very clear who i am 
as a therapist in the relationship, who they are, and also who the horses are. So we have this triangle, this uh, tripartite relationship that gets uh, formed and actually sets um, the sort of the basis of, of the working uh, alliance and the working relationships. And any kind of negotiations that go on there, you already get a lot of information about who is standing in front of you or what this group is is about. People will, will um, kind of reveal quite a lot of themselves vis-a-vis their relationship with risk and safety and caution and all those kind of things. Then, of course, we kind of take um, on to the next um, step. And the next step is all about how do we now connect? So bearing in mind that the majority of people who um, who come to us are not familiar with horses. If I say to someone, go and introduce yourself to that horse, that seems like a really simple thing, but it's actually really quite complicated. And it does allow you to kind of reflect on how do I actually introduce myself to people as well? How do I engage with the outside world? What do I bring of myself? What kind of emotion comes up? If I have to think about, you know, making a presentation, standing up in front of a group of people, walking into a pub and not knowing anyone there, what does that bring uh, up for me? Had that kind of connection? What kind of assessments do I make um, around around all of that? And and ultimately, that's the sort of the first time we really start almost taking a forensic approach to understanding how do relate how do people do relationships? How do they create connections? And how do they create connections that work for them? And how they create connections that doesn't work, that don't that do not work um, for them. So, for example, we look at you know, do people try and pick up some grass if they're in a field and try to to feed the horse? And and it's quite an interesting one because you kind of can reflect back and people go, okay, this horse is standing in a whole field of grass, and now you're picking some grass and you're giving it to the horse, and you're and the horse doesn't actually take that grass why do you think what's so special about the grass that you're holding in your hand whereas the horse can actually pick the grass whenever this horse wants to kind of eat the grass so what were you doing by picking this up and people don't typically know the answer to that but those are the kind of things that they really need to work with kind of thinking what was i trying to do at this point was i trying to seduce this horse was i trying to um, make this horse like me in some kind of way would you know if i come into a relationship and if i give a lot will i be liked back will i become a different person and all these things about likability and how, who do, how do i behave with the people around me you know trust how much trust is there in my relationships do i feel the relationships I have are very transactional. Um, how people build that initial contact and connection with the horse tells me a huge amount of how they are in relationship to other people as well. And it's much cleaner having a horse and kind of actually talking about how you're connecting and relating to a horse, because actually you, you know that it's probably unlikely that whatever you think the horse is feeling is actually anything to do with the horse, far more likely that it is your projection of what you imagine might happen. It's your fantasy about how that relationship might work. And if we can unpick that and we can take that projection back, we're actually getting a huge amount of information about you. And ultimately, that's really all therapy and that whole processing um, element. Remember, I was saying the difference in therapy and therapeutic. This is therapy. This is processing something, creating an understanding around something that wasn't previously there. Um, after we've connected, we then want to look at reconnecting because, of course, now it's not fresh anymore. We're now going to reconnect. We're going for a second time and we're looking at, you know, did we find that relationship the same as we had it before? Um, has something shifted? Has something changed? Um, is there something lost? Is the horse more interested, less interested? What does that mean to me? Um, it's it's really about kind of something that was very strange has now become familiar. And now, now it is a bit more familiar. What does that kind of um, now kind of tell us what do we now do we now need to kind of make this familiar strange again in order to become curious around what has happened in this relationship so you see after safety it then very much becomes on this whole way of of, of relating and um um one of the things I, I usually use to describe this as well is that we connect with a horse for sure 
but actually we also connect with and reconnect with a part of ourselves that has been disavowed quite a bit, a part of ourselves that we haven't actually spent a lot of time um, thinking about. And then we get to change because therapy, of course, is also about change, even though I fundamentally believe that change is none of the business of the therapist. Business of the therapist is to be able to kind of offer sufficient understanding so the client can make a better decision around where they now need to move. And movement, therefore, becomes really important. Why? Because um, a lot of people come to therapy because they're stuck. They don't know where to move. They don't know whether they should be going forward or backwards or stay the same, whatever. And of course, horses tell us a huge amount about movement. They on the move pretty much um, all the time. So how to get stuck and actually understand where you get stuck is really quite important because that stuckness I'm talking about is the sort of the cycles and the repetitions that we tend to kind of go through um, a lot as well. So getting a horse from a standing position to a movement position for some people is very straightforward. Other people struggle with that quite quite a bit. So to understand how that movement operates, how we can get a horse to move. And this is, I'm sure, uh, a lot of you will have seen the kind of the exercises that people do and kind of thinking, you know, what are these exercises about? How do we move horses from A to B and all of that? Equine assisted psychotherapy is never about the exercises. The exercises are there actually when as a therapist you get stuck and then you get you throw an exercise in because you feel that will shift something. But it's really all about how people um, start engaging and working with these relationships. And of course, movement really incredibly important to kind of get things unstuck. But once we got movement in our model of change here, of course, we can move around, but we still don't know in which direction we want to kind of now direct that movement. And that really is about a sense of purpose. How do people bring a sense of purpose to this? And that's the final piece of, of, this, of this model. Um, so we're going to come up with, with some questions at the end of that, if there's any questions uh, around that. But these phases are the phases I've sort of observed over two decades of working. Seeing these elements are really important and horses can really help us uh, reflect because we are in it. We are there. We're not just talking the talk. We're walking the walk. We're actually there working with horses and having a lot of feelings around and a lot of thoughts around what's actually happening to, to us in, in all of that. So each session will have elements of all of these, or some sessions will have only an element of, of one. And um, it just gives you, and sort of therapists who just come into this work, it gives you a way of anchoring yourself. Where am I? What is actually happening? Because what the therapist does in all of this actually takes a back, a back step and starts looking at the horse in the center. So the horse actually becomes the focus of the whole therapy, which means that usually if you're a therapist, it's the relationship with your client or your patient that's the focus. But of course, because you're in that, you don't, you know, familiarity does cloud your own vision. As if you're standing on the outside, you can really observe in a lot more clarity what is happening. So horses really are the methodology of um, the therapy in the same way that art or drama or music or movement or any of these kind of things become the sort of the, the method through which to elicit a model of change through it. And that's really how, how horses um, help humans. As I said this before, we don't just connect with the horse, we connect, reconnect with the disavowed part um, of ourselves. Let me tell you a little bit about the kind of things um, that we um, do with, with, with people. We have specific treatment programs for um, people with addiction. And addiction is actually where we, where we started. Um, and I particularly think with groups um, of, of, of addiction, um, equine assisted psychotherapy works incredibly well. Um, because a lot of people who would come to, to this kind of work have the language, they have the therapeutic language, they can talk and talk and talk and talk, but actually it's about action and bringing it there. And horses um, really help shift things there quite a, quite a lot. Anything to do with eating disorders and body is, is, is as anyone probably would tell you, is, is one of the most difficult groups to to kind of work with and language again tends to be very challenging around that we've had incredible um sort of success stories um in in this space 
using horses um, there, depression and anxiety, um, a lot of work around around that as well. We work with young people, self-harm quite a bit, which which are specialist um, sort of groups set up. Um, trauma, um, we've recently started bringing uh, EMDR, so eye movements, desensitization and reprogramming into it as well, because horses again lend themselves very, very much to um, aspects of that as well. Um, ASD, sort of autistic spectrum, ADHD, typically again working in, in groups around that, although we do kind of work with adults in a one-to-one -one way in, 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 in that as well. Um, and a, a more recent thing that we brought as well is a day clinic, which includes equine assisted psychotherapy, but also brings in mindfulness, processing groups, and, and psychological education. And this is quite an important um, sort of aspect because that really allows us to bring people who um, who have been um, in patients in a, perhaps a mental hospital um, and for whom just having a weekly session with a therapist just doesn't work. They need a little bit more structure than that. Being outside with horses, being on the move, doing all of that can be incredibly beneficial to allow that, to, to give people that, that additional um, structure, which and they find really um, quite quite useful. They would not necessarily go and sit in a room somewhere, but actually being out about in, in the park with us is incredibly beneficial. We've done work in prisons, um, a program called Centaur Inside, where we did a lot of work. Um, we actually brought horses, brought two shy horses in inside um, prisons. Um, we did... Um, a, quite a lot of research um, with with this group, and we also had the um, real advantage um, that we managed to kind of have a control group as well, um, because we we selected a group of, of of prisoners who then also came outside and joined us, um, and we had a, a control group, so people who we just assessed and didn't do the intervention, and then we swapped, of course, afterwards. They kind of did come to the intervention, but it allows us to kind of basically say, is the change really to do with what we're bringing into it, or is it just by chance? And having a control group really allows you to kind of look at that. So we kind of looked at people in terms of initiatives and effort and persistence and engagement and all of that. And on all those markers, things really, really went up um, quite a lot. So we're kind of f seeing that people from far more fragile mental health bases actually became much more robust, and much more um, much more resilient um, as, 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 a, as a result of the eight-week um, sort of treatment program. And I want to give you a couple of, of, of um, people's voices here because I think this will uh, bring things a bit more um, alive. So Heath is a big grey shire horse that just over about around 19 hands and goes, Heath was crowding me. He was standing so close I felt I had no space. The team asked me what I could do and I said nothing. When they said, why not try pushing him back? I thought they were really mad. He was, you know, he weighs more than a ton. But I pushed and he did move. I burst into tears. I never realized I could have my space so easily if I decided that's what I wanted. And this is a really classic example of how equine assisted psychotherapy works. You do something very physical with a horse in the here and now. And it goes back to thinking, wow, this is what this means to me. This is how this kind of, and I don't want to use the word trigger in a, in a loose, in a very loose kind of way. This takes me back to something very different. I felt I could not move these things. What else in my life is there that I think weighs a ton and I can't move? And actually, if I can move this horse, maybe there's other things I can shift as well. So let's see what this horse stands for right now. Let's kind of think about what these other elements are in my life. So this is what I mean by saying, you know, People may not want to talk, they have an experience with a horse, and then they can't actually stop talking about it because it was such a, an insight they were, they were getting through that. Second one, likely lad, another horse uh, that we had got quite close to me and he was in my space. He trod on my foot. I felt a bit like what he was doing. He, he was just doing what he wanted. I felt a little bit powered, a bit trodden on. And thinking about it now, it reminds me of my relationship with people. Due to my lack of confidence, other people might do stuff and I don't always stand up for myself. It gets to the stage where it goes on for a while. And instead of saying something in the beginning, I end up exploding in the end. So horse steps on your foot, you feel trodden on. That's a really, really um, one of those kind of insights that it would tell, 
it, it would take weeks and months before you actually get something if you just sit there uh, in, in a clinic, in a consulting room or any of that. Very, very um, immediate. I learned that we need to communicate more with each other just because Murdoch, which is another horse, has a harness on. It doesn't mean that you're in control. So people pick up on the minutiae and what you're kind of doing with this. And of course, then the humans are there to help hold the frame and actually help people um, to reflect on their experiences. Um, we work um, with young people in something called the Centaur Club, which is much more um, about kids in care in effect. So people who looked after children uh, who come and actually do a lot of work on what it's like to, to look after horses, for example. So they kind of, they become sort of taking more perspective of, of putting themselves into a care, um, looking after position rather than being the ones um, looked after. With those groups of young people as well, we do a lot of um, anti-bullying interventions, uh, for example. And again, a nice opportunity to to kind of do some work with that. We the, the sessions, six sessions, and again, we found that um, people decreased their bullying behaviors quite a bit. Um, so items in these surveys were about, um, you know, giving soft kids a hard time being part of a group or teasing people and pre and post uh, measurements of, of of all of these we kind of see that um the pro-social behaviors were going up so people at the at the, the end of that was more about making friends and being more pro-social we use shire horses for for this and you know you can't bully a shire so really what we were doing with these horses and the way this intervention works is that we start off perhaps with an adversarial uh, group an adversarial system but bit by bit people start seeing that actually cooperation works better in the long run and conflict doesn't give you quite the satisfaction that you want um pre-intervention in the groups we had uh, so the blue are people victims of bullying pro-social behaviors in green and bullying behaviors in 33 post-intervention what we could see is that we could grow the pro-social behaviors um, very significantly and reduce um, the bullying behaviors quite significantly as well we didn't change um, the group that identified as victims all that much um, actually it stayed it stayed the same through throughout but I think that's partly because it's quite unrealistic that we could actually shift something like um, like that so that group probably needs a much more one-to-one -one, uh, more clinical intervention whereas for the wider group it was easier for us to change um, those behaviors working with the horses these are groups um, of quite challenging uh, young people pupil referral uh, units um, people who um and young people who, who would not sit in front of a lecture and listen to to kind of these kind of things but actually getting them out and about and getting them engaged with the horses in that way really showed um quite a lot of differences the connection um project which is the next one is really looking at people on the on the spectrum um we have a a particular way of of looking at um autism um which is that we don't use a deficit model at all and we want to work with the carers and the parents around that um to kind of look at how um particularly you know autistic young people are actually quite sophisticated in their communications you know autism is seen as a as a as a, as a, a disorder of communication so actually we're kind of showing that they're actually pretty sharp in observing how the horses behave. So a horse may have his ears pinned back completely and the parents go, go and say hello to the lovely horse. Um, and the kids think, I don't have anything to do with this horse. I think, yeah, because kids on the spectrum, whether they have experience with horses or not, they can read the ears, whereas their parents usually don't really pay any attention to what the ears do um, at all. So I think that's quite quite an interesting um, um, sort of observation that we've made over, over the years um grace yeah again connections there eye contact um building a huge amount of confidence there is no cure for autism so really what we're we're kind of doing is we're kind of working kind of looking at how people present how they bring in and what we can actually do to help them make connections with the world um around them so when language again back to language when language is sidestepped 
sophistication of, of, of communication becomes uh, to the fore um, a lot more and um, removing social constraints around this group I think we can get these youngsters to actually explore what it's like to to be them with those horses rather than kind of forging them into something that we would like them to be or some sort of ideal version um, rather than actually looking at who they are, what they bring, and how we can kind of just work with what that's about. Um, recovery, that's the final um, one I want to, to kind of look at. Um, I think that there'll be copies of these these slides uh, as well. But with recovery, with addiction, we really want to kind of look at how people can become far more um, aware, um, how we can explore how a group works together, uh, how we can find new ways of interacting uh, socially and, and at the same time still providing challenging and therapeutic insights relevant to uh, the addiction, whatever the addiction is. So we work with um, alcohol and drug addiction, but also gambling or sex, sex addiction, um, many, many different, many different ways. So this group, we measure change on these sort of variables, openness to experience, trust, asking for help and all of that. And what we found was quite a lot of significant uh, evidence around this as well. So 80% of patients reported that they were more open to feedback. 92% of patients reported increased levels of confidence. And this is a large sample group. We kind of had about over 500 people in this in this group. And then three quarters reported um, having a lot more awareness of actions having consequences and also being more open to uh, emotions and new challenges. Um, with addiction, asking for help is an incredibly important element because there's a lot of shame involved and people feel too ashamed to actually um, ask for help. Working with the horses really, really um, speeds that up and gets people to overcome any kind of feelings of shame um, around that. And actually being right here and right now also um, very important in, in addiction. If you kind of have to say to someone, um, you know, you're never going to drink ever again the first thing that people do is kind of think oh well, what we're going to do if, if it's christmas or it's my birthday um and you kind of think let's not worry about birthdays christmas let's just worry about the next hour and see how how we can work um with with that and um yeah lots and lots and lots more in the book um i'm also running a course which is looking at essential skills and equine assisted uh, psychotherapy so um, information there for you um, as well and Nick shall I come to you and see thank you for that that's really it's just so interesting to hear how you use the horses um, in your therapy work and and how varied um, the different types of therapy are and, and how you do it and it's quite amazing it's obviously um, very much a each individual um, person um, has a very different experience um, when you're when you're doing therapy in this way. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we've sort of, you know, over the years, we kind of, I think when we first started, we probably bring quite a lot of mixed groups, and as as we kind of progressed, we kind of understood that there are even with 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 bringing certain horses in into it, there are certain horses that will work with an addiction group really, really well that, um, you know, and other horses wouldn't because in addiction, there's there's a lot of stuff under the surface that comes in um, that people are not really ready to discuss and want to kind of take on board. Um, and horses pick up on this and some are too sensitive to be able to, to, uh, to work with that. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've just had a question pop up at the side here. Um, somebody would like to know the name of your book so ooh, my book i want i wanted to call my book real horsepower actually because that's really the kind of title of this of this whole series but the editors um uh, said that that's not gonna work for like google search terms and stuff so my book rather boringly is called equine assisted psychotherapy and coaching an evidence-based approach which is a bit of a mouthful but it is actually what it what it says on the tin so mm -hmm. um um, I think they probably were right in that. But uh, yeah, real horsepower, I think, just sounds a lot better, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's, I mean, so many of us, um, particularly those of us that are involved with horses day to day, um, almost think of horsepower as in the physical sense. Yes. Um, but actually hearing it 
from su such a different perspective um, really kind of opens up your mind as to what these horses are capable of doing for us in more than just that competitive sense of you know going into a dressage arena or going out show jumping um, actually the world's your oyster with them in the sense of you know what they could be doing for us on the whole you know absolutely and I and I think there is something about I mean if you look at our history, even if you look at sort of, you know, pictures of of, of the streets in any town, um, you know, or let, I mean, let's say London, for example, and you kind of look at footage of London 100 mm. years ago, it's full of horses and people yeah. would have been so used to being around horses all the time and they'd have a sense of of them and and they would just be part and parcel of, of, of life. Mm. And they've sort of become so much redundant in a way that they're now just kind of they're now in these very specific little boxes you know they race or they do dressage or they you know police horses are probably the most the ones that people see the most have an opportunity to kind of see the most but that's a sort of you know it's it's a bit of a demotion i always think for the horses that they're actually not as essential anymore they're not as central yeah. in our lives and in therapy bringing them into therapy they really become massively um, important again and, and I think that's one of the things I, I like about it they're, they're not just leisure or they're not just you know great to have because we're showing or we enjoy them they're actually functional they have an incredible function and an incredible purpose and mm -hmm. again therapy uh, being able to work with horses in therapy is is great because we managed to keep some of our old retired shire horses for much much longer because they they were engaged their brain was engaged they were yeah. they were coming out they were doing therapy work and they, they were still you know coming in we think of retirement and just putting horses in the field somewhere and these are horses that had a connection with us their whole entire life yeah. and they just feel a little bit I think, without wanting to anthropomorphize, but I'm kind of thinking they look they look to come in. Our horses look to come in. They don't kind yeah. of run off in the corner of a field. They actually quite like the fact that we're around and do this. And in a sense, the kind of the the words sort of Operation Centaur doesn't come from the sort of the human side of it. I always kind of felt more that old horses become human. They they've studied us for years and years and years they know exactly what we're going to do next yeah. and that's the, that's really where the center i think the centaur in some ways is the horse that's become mm -hmm. human rather than the human becoming a horse they know us better than we do <laughs> absolutely they do they can yeah. they can predict what we're going to do next yeah yeah and do you find you, you mentioned obviously people um not having horses around um on a day-to-day -day basis as they would have in the past particularly in sort of town environments where access to horses is actually very limited do you find them very sort of in awe of their size yeah i mean this happens a lot with 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 the kids from the inner city london schools for example you know they had they have never been that close up and if they have been close up it's tended to be you know police horses or military and immediately then they become fused with a sense of authority and, and yeah. which is clearly one of the things that they struggle with quite a lot is is the kind of you know because you know, it represents law and order and to actually see a horse that you can kind of that's much softer that you can kind of build a relationship mm -hmm. around and, and and all of that gives them a very very different uh, perspective and you know i i go and visit these these kids in their in their environment first and i'm thinking gosh you know we've bitten off too much that we can chew here because there is you know this is so chaotic people do not want to listen to do any of, of of this and then you bring them out and they're in front of a horse and yeah. and they just fall silent um you know we have, we'll feature one of these horses in in um i think in, in one of the clips that we're going to do in the next couple of months um an arabian and he is you know so fast and when we get kids with adhd with the diagnoses um you know they all fall really silent they all come get get very quiet because this horse picks up all the energy and he's just out there and they're like a centrifuge they all come and stand around me and they look in awe at this yeah. horse that can't stand still and has all this kind of stuff and they're thinking that's you guys you know this yeah. isn't and you're falling silent and you're seeing this kind of manifested now it's um, yeah. very powerful I was gonna say it's quite a representation, isn't it, in front of them to see, to see that, like I say, that energy and um, and a horse, a, a total free spirit, and displaying all that energy and it's quite very amazing. much so. Um, so we're having a few questions pop through here. Um, 
so we have a question here. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, speaking from experience, going to a care farm with horses helped me so much um, with work, burnout and depression. What would you advise to anyone wishing to begin a, a career helping people with equine assisted, uh, equine assisted therapy? Right. Good question. Um, I think it's really, really the, the bit I was talking about um, about therapeutic versus therapy is a really, really important point. Mm -hmm. And it's not to kind of say that if you know a lot about horses that you can't be useful, that you can't listen. But what it really what being a therapist or a psychotherapist means is that you you belong to a body of professionals that has certain ways in keeping you safe. Mm -hmm. um, that prevents you from burning out, um, that um, gives you recourse. If someone wants to complain about what you're doing, that you can kind of, you know, you're protected by a body of people who know that certain things sometimes happen and all of that. You get supervision, you get mm -hmm. your own therapy. So there's all these things that are built into these systems to actually keep the person who does the care uh, safe in, in, yeah. in lots of ways. And you can get really, really unstuck in helping relationships if you mm. don't understand your own motivation to help people, for example. So it's a yeah. really, really important thing to 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 get to 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 the bottom of. And as I said, you know, kind of horses really in many ways are a methodology. They, you know, you need to kind of understand a human condition on the one hand and then bring this in. Um, you know, if you kind of play an instrument and you're very, very good at and playing the guitar, for example, that doesn't make you a guitar therapist. It, it means it, it means that you kind of know how to play the guitar really, really well, but you haven't done that piece to then connect with, with people around it. What yeah. we do, and this course I was talking about on essential skills, is really about giving an introduction to how horses are being used mm -hmm. in in psychotherapy and what the skills are that are required around it but i always made it very very clear to people it does not make you an equine assisted psychotherapist you have to kind of use kind of go and become a therapist or a counselor or a coach first and then bring these skills into into your work so you mention um certain bodies that um as you say um you as a as a um, psychotherapist actually would need to to be involved with what perhaps would people need to look for um if they're wanting to become involved in this type of, of therapy what would they need to um what type of body would they need to see their therapist being um involved with yeah, so the, the kind of the, the two main bodies in this country are the BACP, so that's the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapists, and the UKCP, which is the United Kingdom Counselling and Psychotherapists. So those two are, I think, the kind of the, the, the main bodies um, uh, that sort of accredit and register um, and, and working through that. And I think, you could, of course, you can do this alongside. You know, you can, um, you can kind of start a course just that are generally looking at how you you know how therapy works and how you can mm. understand therapy and then you can think okay well actually i'm really really interested in horses i want to bring horses into it i always kind of think that you know if you have horse knowledge already of course it works it works a lot better because if you if you don't really know about horses it's it's even more challenging i think i mean that's you know igala has this is model where you have two people you have a horse specialist and you have um, um, a psycho a, a therapist. Um, I don't think that kind of necessarily works. I mean, it can work if you know each other really, really well. I just mm -hmm. think it really helps if many of the therapists that you also have a really, really good sense of horses. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so a question here um, referring to um, your work with prisons. Yeah. Um, a prison in the USA has inmates breaking um, and schooling captured wild horses, and this has a profound impact on the inmates. Is the UK prison system taking any interest? For example, Halsey Bay um, actually closed its Suffolk Punch provision in 2011. So do you know of any prisons in the UK that are sort of making steps towards? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we've we've worked um, with with this particular prison for a number of years. Things shut down um, with COVID, of course, because it became very, very challenging to do that. And I think legislation changed. So really what we were working with was called the Rottle system, a release on temporary license. And, you know, we don't have Mustangs um, 
that we need to break in. But what we do have is shire horses that do agricultural and conservation work. And what we basically did was to be brought these prisoners out on day release and they would come and work with us and with the horses. And, you know, the amount of impact on self-esteem it has when you've never been to near a horse and eight weeks later, you're actually driving a pair of shires out of the back yeah. gate to Richmond Park is incredible. And people just yeah. got thinking, I had no idea. I never believed that I was going to be able to do that. And here we go. Now you're doing it. And you're also doing something that benefits the local community. Uh, it's conservation work. Um, you know, so David Attenborough comes along and gives everybody a pat on the back because I think it's so fantastic with the kind of stuff that you're doing. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's 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 really fantastic. Um, and yes, a lot more should be happening. I think the prisons at the moment are in a bit of a state, um, and it's it's all quite challenging. We're still talking. We have regular kind of you know quarterly meetings where we discuss and kind of say how wonderful it all was, and we should try and get it back up and running um and i know another couple of people who are in similar positions with us i think it's working with horses therapeutically with prisoners is is, is a is, is a no-brainer it's such a really you know really really effective way of engaging people but mm -hmm. yeah i can't really comment on the on the state of the prison system further at the moment <laughs> um so uh on a slightly different um note uh, are the horses specifically trained by yourself or anyone else? So the horses just have to be horses. They're not trained to do therapy in any kind of way, to be honest. they. But what we select them for is character. And one of the big things that we're kind of looking for are horses that are emotionally available. Um, so... I love working with Arabians. I love working with um, thoroughbreds. Um, I love working with the Shire horses because they are working horses and they seek that relationship with people. Um, so you want the horse that that seeks a connection that's quite sort of curious, but that also is going to respond to whoever brings something. So it's really much more about character um personality i know these are all anthropomorphic concepts but those are the kind of things that we we kind of judge a horse and not all horses make it um to be to kind of coming into into therapy they have to be you know they have to be stable themselves you know they have to be sort of you know they have to be resilient uh them, themselves um as well so yeah that's sort of no training but really quite careful selection um we know that for a long time before we use them in therapy yeah and i guess to an extent you actually want them to display their natural behavior rather than a a trained um yeah you know action absolutely absolutely so yeah horses horses have to bring themselves in the same way that therapists bring themselves actually um you know there's there's only so much training that you can do but you still have to bring yourself in the end yeah um so um a lady here would actually like to know if uh have you ever need volunteers in your practice work um so very very similarly to to what i was just kind of described about the horses we do accept um volunteers um but we need to know people mm. before quite a bit so the way the way volunteering works with us is that people tend to hang out with us and come and muck out and just be around the stables and help around and all of that. And once we start building a relationship with people, then I think people become sort of thinking, okay, we've got a project. Would you be interested? Would you be available to kind of help out with that project? But it would be very remiss, I think, from me to kind of just kind of go, let's kind of bring volunteers in. I mean, the yeah. whole world relies on volunteers and we're super, super grateful for anyone who comes, but if people want to volunteer and they think, I just want to volunteer to come and do the therapy, then that's not workable from, mm -hmm. from our side. We really need to get a sense of people over a couple of months to kind of thinking, how are you going to cope when I put you into this position? Mm -hmm. where, you know, there's some pretty harrowing things happening in, in, in this as well. You know, I need to make sure that people, a bit like with the horses, you know, they need to be emotionally available, but they also need to have some robustness about yeah. them um, as well. And, you know, it's not Disney what we do. It's, it's yeah. pretty harrowing. Mm. 
Yeah, um, I guess you need uh, you need to know that you have people that are very reliable and that have a relationship with the horses. And yeah, um, you, like as you say, you need to know them before you can put them and, into that situation. And and how how do they look after themselves? You know, mm. um, how how can you know if you've you know even the therapy team that we have working with us? There's sometimes some real you know additional care that. I have to do around that as well because there's something you know sometimes things happen and people find it really quite upsetting we're all human beings right so kind of there's only so much that you can kind of you know um cope with and you know some of the referrals that we get are you know I think still for us um particularly like with NHS referrals we tend to be sort of seen a bit as a last chance saloon it's like you know people have tried various other things and thinking well nothing has really worked might as well send them to to kind of do some equine assisted psychotherapy, and then of course we get quite a nice sort of breakthrough because we don't address things in 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 the same way. We allow people mm -hmm. to be for a, for a bit, but what they come up with tends to be pretty harrowing. And you know, we can't, you know, we're not large enough as an organisation to then also make sure that all the emotional needs of the volunteers and the, the wider team is looked after as well. So yeah. it's 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 quite complex. We're you know um. We're always incredibly grateful to to anyone who offers their time uh, freely to to us. Um, but there's asterisks at the end of that statement. There's quite a lot of, of things that we need to be very careful about too. Mm -hmm. You mentioned there about um, you know NHS referrals and um, people that have come to you uh, almost in a feeling that in that desperation that nothing else has, has really sort of fit the bill for them. Do you find that um, the horses almost take the pressure off of a one-to-one in an office situation and offer a little bit more freedom for people to sort of talk about what they need to talk about and to sort of air some of the issues that they're going through? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to start by saying to people, go and tell this horse out loud something you've never told a living soul and you don't have to repeat it you don't have, i don't need to know you don't need to come and tell me the only thing i'm going to ask you was what that was like for you to experience that mm -hmm. and that for a lot of people is a really really life-changing thing to to do because they've heard themselves something they've never said before something they're deeply ashamed of something they've struggled with and all of a sudden it's out there and exists in the world there's a witness to it and it's also people come back and thinking this is the first time i never felt i said something and i didn't feel judged about it i didn't feel that i ought to have done something different there was no reprisals there were no tellings off there was no none of that kind of stuff that i'm normally expecting mm -hmm. And then they come back and they go, that wasn't actually as bad as I thought it was going to be. I may be able to actually now talk about this. And that's, of course, music to our ears, because then you think, OK, we can help you process this. You know, you've taken that first step. The horse helped you take that first step. And that's what I mean. Horses speed things up. You know, yeah. you could be sitting in a room with that person for months and they don't want to talk about about this. But just having that mechanism really allows people to kind of just some relief, you know, hand it over. You know, the horse can carry it. People are really scared thinking it's too much. The horse can never carry it. I'm thinking he weighs a ton. You know, he can carry more than he can throw at this at this horse. You know, he can do this. So yeah. trust. Um, that's how it works. It's amazing, isn't it, what they can do for us? Um so uh, another question here, how do people deal with the idea that you can't keep them completely safe? Does this affect um, how you work with young people? Um, not really in that sense. I mean, of course, there's a kind of there's, there's a safeguarding issues around around young people and the rest of it. But ultimately. From a therapeutic perspective, from a psychological perspective, if you look at safety, safety is an illusion. We can't keep ourselves safe and we can't keep other people safe, actually. You know, not absolutely. It's really what we do around all of that. And I think what I'm what I'm what I find really, really important is that even with younger people, if you hand them more accountability and more responsibility around that it actually builds on that kind of resilience. So we're doing a project with mind uh, starting. 
um, with young people and kind of really focusing on, 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 on mental health resilience around that. And that's very much part of it. It's about how do you keep yourself safe? Uh, you know, I'm not going to be there when you're walking on the streets on your own um, and you're feeling upset about, about something. The only thing I can hope for is that my voice will be in your mind somewhere and you have that as a resource and a register that might kind of help you to think about things and make different appraisals and therefore make different sort of situations. But for me to take all the steps and, you know, do all the kind of safeguarding around it, of course, I'm going to do everything that is legally necessary around all of that. But to the to the minimum that I'm legally required, because to be able to kind of experience that accountability is priceless. It's really, really important part of, of the therapy. Mm. I guess it's really important as well in this day and age where it's always perceived that your that your own safety is somebody else's exactly. responsibility when actually it comes down to you and you alone. Um, spot on, Nick. That is spot on. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with this. Stop outsourcing care to other people. Yeah. Do it yourself. Cool because then you know exactly what you're doing and you can kind of make judgments around it for yourself and yeah. you also you're not going to be let down from yeah. by, by by people around it as well so you take more and I, I know it sounds a little bit harsh and of course we do a lot of things to kind of take care in the you know behind the scenes you know we, we would kind of would never kind of put a dangerous horse with 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 people you know all of these kind of things but ultimately hands down i can't ensure people's safety they are their flight animals mm. that you know something can happen something random can happen and something could go badly wrong touch wood um, that it doesn't but you know things the happen, possibility right? is there so, the risk is there and you know i i, I said this to people when they're kind of with groups in particular kind of thinking okay um this is a task that i'm not going to ask you to do but bear in mind that i've pointed out that you need to look after your own safety you know, I cannot guarantee that something's not going to go awry. You, as a group, you need to take some responsibility for that. How are you going to ensure that? And I ask them, and the group makes decisions. And whatever decisions they make, then that's the group's decisions to, to make. And this goes with young people, for yeah. sure. Young people know about this stuff. And, you know, the more we take away from, from, from them, I think the, the more harmful it is, actually. Yeah, yeah, absolutely um so um we've had a question come through um from somebody here she said if you are already a psychotherapist would the intro course that you offer be enough to qualify you to practice or would there need to be more learning involved so the course is is is, is essentials so it's an essentials course so basically it takes all the kind of the basic principles that i feel are important as, as an equine assisted psych psychotherapist. The way things tend to work in, in, in this sort of field, particularly if you're already qualified, you know, you're, you're then familiar with the idea of supervision. I tend to supervise quite a lot of people who, who kind of set up their own program and start working with horses. And I think that's really how, how it then develops. So you kind of, you do the course, um, you get a sense of it, you go away, you go and practice, but then you come back and you kind of start, can we have a supervision session around it? Can we discuss, this is what I was trying to do and all the rest of it. So it becomes a mentoring kind of relationship. And I think that's how it works. That can't work if you're not already qualified because then the responsibility for me is way, way, way too much. But if you're, if you're kind of, if you know what you're doing already in the helping people sort of field, then absolutely you can be mentored and, 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 and kind of coached uh, through that process really. Okay. Um, and uh, can people, uh, people in need access your therapy from all over the UK? Um. I mean, if they can get to us, yes, mm. I suppose. Um, there is a sort of, you know, there are, there are the, the, so the majority of people come to us either through uh, refer, I mean, the, the majority of people come through through referrals. They Or they come through NHS or social services or health insurance, although we don't directly deal with health insurance, but we deal with health insurance through, say, a private hospital. Mm. and stuff so about 70 percent of the people who come to us don't actually pay us for it it's kind of it's it's paid for in in, in some kind of way about 30 percent of people privately pay for for the treatment um 
and that's really how um yeah so people can self-refer through a number of different things or they can talk to providers um like nhs like social services and saying you know and build a case and saying this is really important and we have relationships with some councils uh around probably more local to to us but yeah this is yeah you can kind of uh, um you need to be creative um and one last question to um wrap up the evening um I foster teenagers with therapeutic placements and also have horses. Do you think there would be a benefit for the different traumas of young people in the care system? Um, so is, is the question about this person's using her horses to work with trauma? Uh, I think it's slightly broader in terms of the, the way I perceive it, slightly broader in terms of uh, young people with different um, yeah. particular issues and um, would that potentially be a benefit for those types of people? Absolutely. I mean, I think, I think you know, trauma, either with a small or a capital T, is, is, is such a pressing issue in mental health at, at, at the moment. And I think horses do, horses do this in two ways. Horses do it um, in the first place, I think, about building a safe base around something and... Um, you're sort of, you know, you, you're kind of uh, uh, learning about trust in relationships and all of that. And it's not a human. So, you know, because usually typically the trauma comes from an interaction with another human. So this is this is an, an animal, an animal that also experiences anxiety. Um, you know, there's lots of overlaps around that. And I think the, the work that we're doing at the moment with with trauma in particular is bringing EMDR into it. So EMDR is 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 a very very uh, established uh, evidence based method of, of working through trauma. It's very similar in the, in its foundations of what I just talked about with the equine assisted psychotherapy because it also does not require you to tell your story if you do not want to tell your story. You can I can for example say to you Nick, you think of the worst bit of that that has happened and I now like you to kind of focus on that and now we're going to do an exercise to help process that. I don't need to know what happened to you. Mm. That is really quite powerful in some ways because I think people stop accessing help because they don't want to tell their story. They, yeah. they, you know, that's stopping them. And after you say, no, 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 I don't need to know. You think about it, and I'll help you focus. And then you tell me what comes up for you, and we mm -hmm. can you can give me enough process comments that I never really need to know what really, really happens to you at that at that point. Eventually, you probably will disclose it because at that point, it won't matter so much in, 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 anymore for you. But you don't have to start with that. And I think this is really one of the big things that the horses do. They help make that connection so you can start some piece of work and actually speed things up really, really quickly. That's amazing. Um, thank you so much for your time this evening. Um, no, it's been absolutely fascinating to hear about, you know, all the work you've been doing and and all the different horses and the effects that they've had, um, you know, with with groups of people and people that have come to you. Um, and we've had a number of um, comments come through um, in the chat box saying how how brilliant the presentation was and how interesting they found it. Um, I think we've covered most of the questions, um, but um, for any we've missed, we'll we'll pop back through and um, and pop a reply over to you. Um, but thank you for joining us this evening, and um, like I say, Andreas, thank you so much, and uh, and we'll speak again soon. Yes, no, thank you very much, and thank you to Saracen to kind of really launch this. I think it's 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 uh, I think it's a great partnership. I think it brings. Um, a focus of mental health to to a whole different kind of range of 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 the horse world as well, and I think it's it's really important that you know horse world looks after itself as well in yeah. terms of mental health and not just after their after their horses. So thank yeah. you for that. I think this has made a, a, a fantastic start as well to that series um, that's upcoming over the winter. Um, you know, so we can sort of have a little look at each particular um, you know issue piece by piece and and how how you sort of approach that with with the work that you do super thank you very much and thank you everyone for for kind of listening and being here thank you